Good afternoon. I want to welcome you all especially to our first symposium in the year 2023 on our platform, Center of Excellence in Migration and Global Studies of the National Open University of Nigeria. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor of this university, Professor Olufemi Peters, I welcome you to this platform where we discuss migration and global study issues. I am Gloria Aneto, the director of this center. I want to assure you that today we are going to have a very fruitful discussion on this uh, platform. But before I go to introduce our speakers and tell you about today's uh, 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 symposium topic and all that, let me just quickly remind you of the role of our center, Center of Excellence in Migration and Global Studies of the National Open University of Nigeria, which was established in February 2020. So the center is still relatively young, but it's come of age because three years is uh, not uh, too small to come of age in terms of uh, talking about academic issues. In this center was established by the TED fund with a, a seed fund. And the main function of this center is to look into migration and global studies issue. The center was uh, actually, the center actually, the center came to board and the tenor of the immediate past vice chancellor of this great university, Professor Uba Adamu, who today has apologized to you all that he is in another occasion and will be, on, uh, will be absent from this uh, discussion. And he, he is not so happy about it, but he just could not help himself. So, and the first um, director of this center is also Professor Akim Tijani, who is the pioneer uh, director of the center, who worked to make sure that the center was really having a good footing, which I climbed on to be at this level. So we cannot, but always remember to mention these people because they made it happen. And the current vice chancellor is giving this center its maximum support and is very uh, determined to make the center thrive even better than what he took over. Having said that, let me quickly tell you about the vision of this center is to be the bridge between humanity and the future. And the mission is to provide sustainable leverage for interdisciplinary research in migration and global studies. And its core values is their, its core values are integrity, inclusion, diversity, service, and participatory. Its core mandates include the following: to provide leverage for field-based and solution-driven research to serve as agents of national policy for migration and global study issues, to seek grants for academic activities and outreach for sustainability, to publish and sustain peer-reviewed academic journal and monograph series. I'm happy to inform you that the center, almost at its birth, started to produce journal for this center. And the name of our journal is International Journal for Migration and Global Studies. It's very much online, it's visible online. You can just type in that name and put NOUN, it will take you straight to the site of our journal. And um, we are now going to put online in a very short while, our volume three. And if you can agree with me that center is three years and the journal is already volume three. So we are moving every day higher and higher. So to collaborate with stakeholders in the field and policy makers, and to organize occasional seminars, conferences, and public lectures. Ours is no more occasional, it's very frequently. And I want to use this medium to still remind us that henceforth, 
We shall be having monthly presentations uh, on this uh, platform. So we have May, then we have June, one one presentation to give you better service. So after this symposium, our next meeting will be 12th of May. The first, the second one is in May. I think it's 10th of May. And then we have another one in June, just like that, so that we can have a, a more fruitful deliberation and really go into details. So please, as many of you as are here that have not had any presentation with us, we'll try to call on you. Please do not refuse us because we expect you to share knowledge with us as our presenters of today have agreed to and are going to give us what they have for us. So having said that, let me now go to uh, today's presentation. The theme of today's presentation, let me quickly remind us again, even though it was in our flyers that we sent out, is in and out of Africa, nature, multidisciplinarity, and convergence. I want to especially thank Professor Akim Tijani for giving us this theme that we dwelt on. Because he, whenever the director runs into trouble of what topic do I think of next for this kind of thing, Professor Tijani readily comes to mind. And it's always there. He will just fish out one fantastic thing for us. And I start to work on it. So he started it by giving us that fantastic thing. And I started to work on that and contacted the people I feel can do justice to it. So once again, we thank Professor Akim Tijani for his support. I am going to, today's presentation is going to uh, go three of them we present, but let me start with the person that I call first will be the first presenter. The next person I talk about will be the second presenter. And the last person I talk about will be the last presenter in no particular order of superiority, but it's just to make things flow. However, I want to quickly tell our presenters before I introduce them one after the other, I'm going to introduce all three of them so that they just keep coming. We won't need to introduce them again. To quickly remind them that each presenter has 10 to 15 minutes to talk to the soft thing that he or she has chosen. 10 to 15 minutes, that is fine. So at the end of the day, we have about a maximum of 45 minutes so that people can ask questions and make comments. And of course, when we use question time and comments time, it will be directed to the speaker that you want to answer the question. And the, each speaker will just take note of questions and comments and will be given chance to respond after so that we don't have in, a question and answer you know, disturbing the flow. They finish all the comments and questions then we now answer. So I will advise that each speaker has a biro and paper so that you note the ones you are going to respond to as directed to you. So today, let me take the first sub theme we have today is going to be multidisciplinarity from indigenous knowledge perspective. And the speaker that we take that is Professor John Ayotunde Ishola Bewaji. So let me quickly introduce him. Professor Ayotunde Ishola Bewaji, PhD philosophy and MA distance education. First emeritus professor of philosophy, University of West Indies, and member of the One University Task Force to academic a mentor. He has been a mentor to academic in that and the member of Kodisera, Kodisera which is the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa. He has also been a member of that and mentors in Africa and former VCT research fellow, Rhodes University in 2022. He has been a senior research associate of Bafemi Awolowo University Ileife in Nigeria and University of Johannesburg. He has been part of Carnegie Cordestra Visiting Professor of University of Ibadan 2016 and Obafemi Awolowo Ileife in 2021. Newman Endowed Visiting Professor of Philosophy of Culture, Brooklyn College, Honey, United States of America, 2011 to 2012. Gokingham Research Fellow, 
in Philosophy of Culture 2010, member Global Summit of Bioethics, former chairman, National Bioethics Committee of Jamaica, UNESCO founding editor, and Caribbean Journal of Philosophy, founding president, International Society for African Philosophy and Studies, founding president, Academy of African Indigenous Religions, Theology and Arts. He has also been part of that. He was their president too. And his books include Beauty and Culture, 2003, An Introduction to the Theory of Knowledge, 2007, Narratives of Struggle, 2012, Ontologized Ethics, 2013, Black Aesthetics, 2013, Introduction to Philosophy and Logic, 2014, The Rule of Law and Governance in Indigenous Yoruba Society, 2016, The Humanities and the Dynamics of African Culture in the 21st Century, 2017, Media Theory, Practice and Ethics, 2017, Identity Recreation in Global African Encounters, 2019, and Fragmented Identities of Nigeria, 2021. He is Fellow of Nigeria Academy of Letters. What can I say? What else can I say? Of course, we have all convinced from this uh, bio data that this is no other but an erudite scholar who is going to talk to us today. And I'm sure we are all ready and will be all ears. So that is for Professor Ayotunde Dewachi. And I've told you that this topic is multidisciplinarity from indigenous knowledge perspective. The second person that uh, shall be speaking today is Dr. Kudus Oluwatoni Adebayo. And of course, he's going to look at the nature of migration. He is an interdisciplinary scholar with research interests covering African China migrations, settlement and belonging, migration health, urban transformations, and knowledge production. He's a research fellow in the Diaspora and Transnational Studies Program, Institute of African Studies, University of Ibadan, Nigeria, and was a postdoctoral fellow of the Arua Kanegi Early Career Fellowship in the Center of Excellence for Migration and Mobility, African Center for Migration and Society, University of the Wheat Water Strand, South Africa. He holds a PhD in Sociology of Development from the Department of Sociology, University of Ibadan, Nigeria. He was a fellow of the American Council of Learned Societies, Humanities Programs, Dissertation, Completion, and Postdoctoral Fellowships, Fellow of the Consortium for Advanced Research Training in Africa, Qatar. Scholar of the Postgraduate School Scholarship of University of Ibadan, 2014 to 2016, and laureate of the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, Cordestria. His publications have appeared in International Sociology, Migration Studies, Mobilities, Journal of International Migration and Integration, Migration Letters, Field Methods, Global Public Health, Global Networks, Third World Quarterly, The Professional Geographer, and others. So this is also a very wonderful erudite scholar, and we are happy to have him in our midst today because he is a migration guru. And finally, last but not the least, is our very own, our own Linguistics, Professor Iyabode Omolara Mwabwezi, who is going to talk to us about communication convergence, cross cutting the linguistic and technological spaces. He's a professor of English language specialization. She's currently the Dean of Faculty of Arts, National Open University of Nigeria. 
Between 2015 and 2016, she was a visiting scholar at the Department of English, University of Ghana. She has published in reputable academic journals. She published her test, her test introductory phonetics and phonology of English in 2011. It has greatly helped many to master the rudiments of the phonetics and phonology inquiry. She edited a book of readings, communication and language skills in 2018, published by CSSP UK. She is also the senior editor for the book, Linguistic Structure, Language Contact and Virtual Communication, a fresh read for Tayo Lamidi. It received that font sponsorship and is currently in press, now press limited. She has also submitted a book for special convention fund by TED, by TED Fund titled, What is Psycholinguistics? She is a lead author. She is also on the editorial team of journals, national and international, as well as being a consulting editor for some institutions. She has obtained the now Senate Research Grants for two consecutive years, 2021 and 2022, as a team lead and the principal researcher. Her, her, her CV is endless, but let me quickly go to, to the end so that we go straight to today's business. She is also a creative writer with a number of published works to her credit, including Meditations, Just a Little, the weaker one, inspired verses, more than gold, and so many others. These are all online and available on Amazon and Seller.com. She has other works that are yet to be available online, but could be ordered directly from her. She has other manuscripts and uh, the other manuscripts that are being processed for publication including a novel. Her, her hobbies include reading, writing, and serving God. This scholar we have before us is by no means a guru in her field of linguistics. And she's going to tell us how we can relate this to the issue, to the, to the concept, the theme of today, which is in and out of Africa, nature, multidisciplinarity, and convergence. On this note, I will now invite the very first speaker for today, our own Emeritus Professor Ayotunde Bewaji, to give us his presentation. Sir, you have been made a co-host, so you are free to share your screen. Over to you, sir. You have oh, 15 right. minutes. Um, with that, um, Wonderful introduction. I hope um, I will live up to your expectation. Uh, if not, my Oga, Professor Sogolo might uh, have to answer, you know, whatever questions arise for me. Uh, you know, we just put it that to defective manufacturing. And he's one of the one of the <laughs> people who will be responsible for that. Uh, but you know. Thank you so much for uh, having me for this uh, presentation. I actually thought I was going to be the last based on your flyer. So I was going to hide myself until, uh, you know, my turn. All right. Um, you had sent me a note to ask if, um, if there was any PowerPoint and all those things. I have been too preoccupied to break it down into PowerPoint and all that. So I'm really sorry I will not be able to share that, but I hope I'll be able to make sense of what I'll be discussing with uh, your audience so that they can see the challenge. I did a little bit of modification to the title that you read out. Uh, it will not be from an African uh, indigenous knowledge perspective, because that will take me too far afield. 
and that might be very challenging to manage within the time frame. So I have modified it to mean um, Yoruba indigenous knowledge system perspective, because I'm a little bit familiar with that, and I have done a little research in that area. Uh, I know some of my colleagues who believe that uh, we shouldn't uh, be doing this kind of thing, talking about you, but this African that and so on and so forth, might begin to take umbrage with me uh, on that score. But they tend to forget that what we call universal knowledge is actually European traditional knowledge, European cultural artifices that we, 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 we follow. And for them to silence our perspective is no more than doing exactly what they have been doing for so long, dispossessing us of our own ontological agency. And that I refuse to be part of. Um, so multidisciplinarity, I use the phrase multi inter trans cross-disciplinarity to describe what has become a new buzzword over the last three or so decades. And part of what drives that uh, is almost exogenous to the academic system. In other words, it's external uh, forces that seem to be driving it. Um, and as such, when you look at it, our colleagues within the academy are response, responding to those uh, drivers, and especially donor agencies and funding uh, foundations uh, that fund research, who keep calling for transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and all that. And as soon as our colleagues get the funds they need, they revert back to you know, what they are used to. And uh, so where you can see exactly what I'm talking about is where you look at where the rubber meets the road, which is in the form of teaching and learning that takes place in our university system. You find that it is very, very difficult you know, for, for you to have cross-disciplinary teaching and learning in terms of the programs that we have, in terms of the courses that we develop, in terms of the application of those ideas to solving practical problems. So there are two sides to the uh, transdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary thing. On the one side, you have the positive, um, which is where you have uh, concentration of scholars on their individual subject matter. Because the higher you go within the academy, the narrower your focus becomes, uh, because you want to become a specialist. Even in philosophy, you find a situation where if, it's, if somebody were to ask you, what's your specialization, and you say you're a, you are, you are, you are, you are a philosopher, they will ask you which area of philosophy you specialize in, which means you are supposed to be an expert in a narrow thing. But what that does is to take us away from where it all started, where everything used to be natural philosophy, where everything was integrated, where knowledge was integrated and was never divided into silos. On the negative side, you know, is what uh, Lewis Gordon has described as disciplinary decadence. Uh, it's a situation where you now find uh, knowledge systems are parceled into silos. And because they are parceled into silos, they don't speak with each other. They are like Leibniz uh, monads. And as monads, you find that they, they have no windows of communication with each other. Under such an arrangement, you then find that each person is seeing the problem from their narrow perspective. And when you are looking at things from your narrow perspective, it means automatically you are describing in minute details that narrow thing without seeing the interconnectivity that takes place there. And largely, this last point uh, holds its uh, development in the academy to logical positivism and this uh, scientism, you know, both of them dogmas. 
uh, which seem to indicate that only science is capable of uh, giving us knowledge. And when you look at it, you will find that logical positivism itself, you know, doesn't do much because at the end of the day, if you apply the logical positivist criteria to itself, it fails very woefully. And how you know that it fails is that, you know, within the European Academy, you find they find various ways of finding synergy. You find that they have, just like you have the Center for uh, of Excellence for Migration Studies and Global Studies, you do find all kinds of institutions that bring together, you know, uh, people from diverse disciplines to do things that uh, is supposed to inform policy. So now, if you look at that, and you want a concrete example of what colonialism did to us, it's not just uh, the robotization of our humanity, they also destroyed our indigenous academies, our indigenous knowledge production, knowledge dissemination, knowledge application. And that was what uh, Claude Ake described, you know, talking about social science as imperialism. Because and it's the same thing that Paulo Freire was talking about in what he calls the pedagogy of the oppressed. Because when you take these things and then you give them a replacement, and the replacement you give them are so fragmented and fractionalized, it means that they are not able to see their, you know, their issues in a holistic way. Uh, I take a practical example of how the UK, what I call this United Kingdom does about their education. They used to have a program that is called the PPE, Politics, Philosophy, and Economics. That was the program that developed the cadre of, uh, of, of uh, the civil service because it is integrated with philosophy, it is integrated with politics, it's integrated with economics. But in our own case, what they gave us is you know, subdivisions where the economist doesn't know what the, the student of political science is doing. They don't even know the conceptual foundations of both. And consequently, when they get into the civil service or public service, you find that they are talking to each other at cross purposes. So I then wondered, what is driving the multidisciplinary project you know, in, in the modern era? And I say to myself, it's a number of things, okay? A number of things. And I raise a number of questions which I believe we may all want to um, you know, address. Do my colleagues actually believe in multidisciplinarity? Who is afraid of multidisciplinarity? What is, what is it that philosophers are afraid of? In inviting historians into their classrooms, or archaeologists, what are they afraid of? Is speaking to sociologists to come into their classroom. Why is it we work within silo frames and we don't see the interconnectivity between the things that we are doing and how we should be doing them to help to solve uh, the problems that we face? So I have mentioned that what is driving it is not our belief. And when you know what has happened in Nigeria, for example, where the NUC has constituted itself into a super Senate, you know, for the collective universities and determine everything that is done within the university system in Nigeria, what I call the homogenization and pastorization of uh, the disciplines, making them uniform. How do you expect somebody, you know, in Katsina to be teaching exactly the same thing as somebody in Podako? looking at the, the differences between the societies and the environment that they have to serve, you know, it boggles my mind that any organization that is doing what is called accreditation could be doing that. And then I went on, I actually looked at the, the, the various programs that you have in philosophy, take philosophy. The uh, National Open University philosophy program is not different from what you have in Ibadan or what you have in Ife, or what you have in, in um, Osuka, or what you have uh, you know, in Joss. So the question then is, why the duplication? Why is it you don't allow people latitude and freedom? And uh, when one of the new uh, universities, um, you know, uh, 
private universities, let me to assist them in, in you know, developing a program in philosophy, development, and governance. And they submitted it to NU, I mean, the NUC. The NUC threw it back at them. The questions they were asking is, how do you begin to talk about the interdisciplinary nature of who controls what, who does what? Forgetting that what, is, what they are trying to do is a creative way of finding a, the development of uh, personnel who think about problems holistically, especially within the public sector, and they are able to do these things uh, to, to solve problems. So I come back to the question of education because I know that the time uh, is, very, is very limited. I've already gone 30 minutes, so I have seven minutes to finish up. Uh, so the question may be raised, what is the concept of an educated person that we are trying to have, okay? If you, if you factor that into the significant equation of what we are doing, then it becomes interesting to see whether the educational system, the tertiary system that we operate, actually helps in developing, in making, in building that educated human being. Or whether what we are doing is actually miseducating that human being. Because when you look at it, people have all kinds of fancy degrees. They have all kinds of fancy titles. It is only within the Western system of education that we have that people can have all the titles. They can be the best they are in their fields, but the worst set of human beings with no good interpersonal relationship, with no respect for the humanity of others, with no respect for the society, the survival of their society, which then creates the problems that we continue to face over and over. And I put that to the fractionalization, the fragmentation of knowledge that does not prepare people to understand the connectivity between the things that they go to school to, to learn and the society within which they live. Let me give an example of how in the US and in other places, they try to make up for the, uh, you know, the fragmentation of knowledge. I take the case of uh, Brooklyn College, for example, CUNY, and many other universities, what they do is that they have what is known as core curriculum courses. And the core curriculum courses are things that every student must register for, which help to supplement the special the specialist disciplines in which they are enrolled. And in the US, you actually find that people can design their own program. You can enter into the university and say, I don't like any of the programs you have here. I want a BSc in this particular area. And then you put together, you select what it is you want. And then you go ahead and do it because you define what your future is going to look like. And as such, that helps you to determine how you go about it. All right. Uh, if questions arise down the road, I'll be able to, uh, to respond to it. But the, the few minutes that I have, let me spend it now trying to bring in the indigenous Yoruba uh, uh, educational system. I say Yoruba educational multidisciplinarity. Time, you know, is, is of essence, but I will highlight a few things that the Yoruba uh, society does, which prepares the human being for a rounded existence, rounded in the sense of not only having a profession that is a trade, you know, Allah initial work is not a human being, a person who has no job, who has no means of income, you know, cannot be regarded as a human being, or let, you know, is not a, a decent human being, somebody who is lazy, only he is not a decent human being, a thief. He is not a decent human being. Until uh, neighbor of Wagba is not a decent human being. Okay? All of these things are woven into the preparation of the individual for adult life. We don't do that in the universities any longer. All we do is just continue to bombard them with day cards. 
you bombard them with Hegel, we bombard them with all those crazy human beings who themselves were not human beings. I mean, I tell people that it's only colonized minds who have been so mentally bastardized, who will regard the, the icons in the two religions that would go from Abraham's family, and regard them as anything. There is nowhere in Yoruba land where somebody who was a vagabond, who was never married, who had no profession, who had no source of income, will be regarded as a savior. And that is what Jesus is. Within Islam, there's nowhere in Yoruba land where somebody who probably killed his master to marry his mistress and then got married to a nine-year-old who be regarded as, as, as a hero. It's, it just wouldn't happen because that kind of person cannot be an example to anybody, but that's what colonialism has foisted on us because they destroyed us. And in destroying us, they made sure that we could not function properly. And we only look out for guidance from them. So I give a number of uh, Yoruba sayings which will be like snapshots of what I'm trying to convey. Ogmo Oduni will hear me. Today's wisdom is tomorrow's folly. In other words, the reason why you need to have a latitude, a way of looking at the world that is expansive is because the way things are done today may not be the way they will be done tomorrow. Consequently, you must have an idea that what you are doing today may not work tomorrow, okay? That is knowledge does not end in one uh, particular area. In other words, if you're a nuclear physicist, you must understand that there is a genetic engineer who is also looking at an aspect of what you are doing, okay? Okay. The way the world is revolving, we need to revolve with it. We need to evolve. Okay? All of these, when you look at them, what they do is they help you to understand that you can learn from anyone. You can learn from any situation. Everything is interconnected. And when you look at Yoruba society, there is a phenomenon that is called aroku, okay? When a particular problem becomes very, very complicated and cannot be solved, you send aroku, you send a message to other people who know and get information from them. And therefore you find a situation where knowledge is integrated. And that is what, is what has helped uh, Yoruba people in the diaspora in Brazil, where Yoruba is an official language, in Oyotunji in, uh, in, uh, in the US, in Cuba, in Haiti, even in Jamaica, where we have a town that is known as Abe Okuta, all of these things has continued to help Yoruba people wherever they find themselves. So uh, in order for me to, to wind up, what am I talking about when I say interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity? I will use an example from the plantation system in the Americas when Yoruba people were brought in here. And other African uh, communities who were enslaved, you know. Now, what you find is that the only reason the plantation worked because the white man has tried every other op uh, option, okay, to get the plantation going at a profitable uh, way but it never worked simply because the Amerindians were not used to you know, the kind of agriculture to which they were being subjected. So they died, they died in droves, okay? The Arawaks and the Tainos couldn't do what they were being subjected to. They brought in the Irish you know, from, from, from the UK. They brought in people from other places. They just couldn't work. And then they remembered that, oh, Africa is a continent that has a climate that is similar to what we have here. And that was what led to the importation of black people into the so-called new world, which was not new to Africa. And the people who came were agronomists, they were agricultural scientists, they were medical doctors, they were herbalists, they were spiritualists, they were everything. And it was the knowledge that they brought with them, which was what uh, Ivan Van Satima 
celebrated and they came before Columbus by talking about what is known as the empty baggage syndrome. You know, the idea to say that, oh, we don't owe you anything, you came here empty handed. They forget that they didn't, they didn't come with an empty brain, with an empty mind. And that was what set the motion, uh, in motion the agenda of the creativity that we find in the Americas. So uh, with the last uh, three minutes that I have, I want to discuss the point, the question of collaboration in Yoruba knowledge production and use. Um, let me start you know, that with the, the metaphor of Agidima Laja. Agidima Laja, we live in other words, what it is saying is that no single person knows everything. And each member of the uh, knowledge production, knowledge application circle help each other. Okay? It doesn't matter your speciality, even if, if you're a diviner, if you're a herbalist. If you're a drummer, if you're a, a, a blacksmith, if all of you have to integrate your knowledge, support each other, and use it for the development of the society. And as such, they even have this thing where Ifa, Ifa as the phenomenon that helps to diagnose and to solve so many problems, works both on that and also for Lord Mary. In other words, we didn't have the concept of a supreme being that knows everything. And that is why Okot Bitek challenged, you know, uh, Bolaji, Dowu, uh, Biti, and the rest of them, and called them intellectual smugglers. Because all they were doing in robbing African gods in uh, Arabian deity uh, 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 garments is to destroy our understanding of reality. Olodumari will call the Babalawu, his Babalawu, and ask him to diagnose, I have this thing. Or Oeru Miloju, you know, this thing is, is, a, is, a, is, is, is a, you know, I, I can't understand why this thing is going this way. And the Babalawu will come, you know, with Ifa, and he will explain to Olodumari, this is what is happening, this is why it is happening, and so on and so forth. So, what, I'm, what I've been trying to do, uh, you know, to round up, is that <laughs> saying that we need to go back and find ways within the academy where we understand that knowledge is limitless, two, where we understand that the silos that we have constructed, which have become like fiefdoms, like empires, for individual HODs, gains, and all that, which fails to allow inter, cross, trans, multidisciplinary approach to knowledge production and dissemination and research needs to be broken down. And you find that once we do all these things, life will become more meaningful, problems will become more solvable. And that is the purpose of knowledge. Knowledge is not to be put on shelves and discarded. It is supposed to be applied. It is supposed to be for the benefit of society. Certificates are not means of entitlement. They are means of serving society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Well, I'm happy that the presenter was actually conscious of time even though he spent three minutes extra, which is oh. also allowable. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. We really appreciate your contribution. I will not want to take questions yet. Let the next presenter come on board. That is uh, Dr. Uh, Kudus Adebayo. Please, sir, over to you. Please let us note our questions and comments for later presentation. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. All right. Thank you very much. So um, uh, thanks to uh, the center for inviting me, uh, uh, the, the lead and then the speakers uh, for, for, for being part of this. Uh, Professor Bewaji uh, reasonably and importantly you know, raised the uh, 
very, very broad issue, you know, epistemologically that's uh, foundational to how one could reasonably think about um, issue of migration, you know, which is what I'm, what I'm going to think about here a little bit, but particularly in terms of how even the concept of nature, you know, so it's such a broad uh, thing. And um, for instance, you know, in this short communication, um, there are all kinds of areas that um, I'm unable to that I'm unable to cover um, in this uh, particular talk. Um, issue of remittance, even though it's it's very uh, important, it's a big conversation right now. But to offer um, a, a very broad uh, snapshot of what you know uh, the migration uh, um, context has been uh, within Africa um, in the last. Uh, 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 three, four years, you know, what are the emerging trends, what are the um, issues, you know, shaping the way uh, 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 migration has been unfolding uh, in this uh, 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 contemporary uh, period. And in order to do that, I essentially uh, focus on, um, you know, broad uh, understanding to sort of give some ideas, you know, um, uh, of trends uh, that, that we have uh, ongoing particularly um, how that has been shape, taking shape in Africa, I mentioned that, but to also move into a space where one can talk about so-called idea of African migrants image, you know, what the, um, that is so dominant, you know, there's a whole lot of conversation about Africa moving in, in and out, and the way that Africans, you know, embark on this kind of like um, uh, migration to sort of juxtapose um, the, 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 the contradictions, you know, between the kind of data that we have, and also the image of um, African migrants that is currently uh, being projected and what the source of, of these uh, projections or imaginations um, are. And then to sort of give uh, my initial thoughts on some of um, on what I consider to be um, a relatively new development, not because it's unusual, because we have a lot of, um, we have had um, waves of migration, you know, in and out of Nigeria uh, from the late uh, 70s, you know, up to the current period. But particularly to show how the concept of, you know, of, of JAPA is connected to uh, new technologies and, and the kind of imaginations, you know, that come from that and the kind of um, actors that are kind of shaping, you know, this particular space. So these are just like um, uh, initial thoughts, uh, and I am hoping that um, during the Q&A, there will be um, um, queries that, you know, if I can answer, I will be happy to, to, to offer uh, thoughts. So um, really, uh, general uh, dictionary definitions will, will talk about migration being the movement of people to a new area or country, you know, where they try to find work or, or better living condition. And migrants will be those um, persons, you know, who are taking place, who are, who are taking part in this, in this movement. Um, uh, and seeking uh, better lives, seeking better working conditions, which a lot of people have called um, uh, in the context of um, survival, you know, so-called greener uh, pasture. But what we do know uh, really is that um, what constitutes migration on, and what quali who qualifies as, as migrants is determined by a lot of factors and works from um, IOM, uh, a lot of other organizations, or even from scholarly perspective, you know, show that there are all kinds of considerations you know, that come into the way the identity uh, of migrants are, are framed and the way different kind of movements, you know, are, are, are explained as constitutive of migration, you know. So we talk about mobility here and there, internal and, and, um, and cross-border. But also to emphasize uh, particularly that um, I, um, factors such as uh, place of birth, you know, where people are born and things like that, this kind of citizenship they hold and where they reside and the um, uh, duration of their stay in those places actually um, shape uh, the way, whether, whether or not a particular event is, is qualified as, um, uh, uh, as a migration or uh, the person who engage in those, you know, are, are seen as uh, migrants. But given that as, as it may, we know that um, we have a lot of um, uh, people qualifying, you know, whatever guys, you know, as migrants, you know, uh, in this uh, contemporary time. And, and the data, you know, through the work 
done by uh, um, IOM from the um, uh, World Migration Report um, shows that uh, a, we have about 281 million uh, migrants uh, today um, around that, and then that constitutes about 3.6% um, uh, of our uh, global population. And you can see that if we look at historical uh, trajectory, that there has been increase in absolute number over time, even though uh, migrants as um, a percentage of um, the population of the world, you know, um, has been uh, fluctuating. But of course, in the last 20 years, we have seen a uh, consistent um, sort of like um, uh, growth in terms of that proportion. So that means more and more people, you know, are, 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 are migrating and uh, both in absolute number and as a proportion of uh, the world's uh, population, as we can see here, currently 3.6%. But if we go back 20 years, we we'll see that just like 2.8% of the pop uh, world's population are um, migrants. What we also know uh, currently is that within this um, uh, number, you know, you have um, upward increase in the number of women that are that are becoming uh, migrants. The same thing for men, you know, who are who are joining the ranks of 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 migrants, and also people who are moving as a result of work, you know, has also been going going up. But um, uh, th there's been an increase, of course, between 2019 and 20. 20 in the number of people or migrants who get missing along the way uh, when, when they travel. And of course, um, this is not a consequence of maybe people not trying to move and all of that, but because of um, experience of COVID-19, you know, from 2020 and upward, you know, which impose um, limitation and how people can move or, or whether or not they can even move at all um, across uh, borders. And within all of these, a particular trend that we've also been seeing is the uh, growth or, or rise in the number of people that are that are that qualify as displaced persons. Um, between 2020 and 2019, we see um, a, a rise uh, in this in this population, and then um, we saw uh, you know more and more people you know uh, becoming refugees, and then um, people who are also um, seeking uh, asylum in particular, of course, reduce the beat. You know, this can also be attributed to, to uh, limit imposed on, on, on movement uh, as a result of COVID-19. But internal displacement, you know, as, you know, continue to go up, you know, this is also linked to issue of violence and, and, and environmental um, crisis, you know, happening um, all over the world. But uh, a closer look, you know, uh, of trends will also reveal that um, since the 1990s and, and, and uh, 2020s, um, there's been a lot of um, increase, a consistent in, um, increase in the uh, number of people who, you know, who are becoming international migrants. And then a lot of them are, are, are going to Europe. So Europe has increasingly had more and more people uh, becoming migrants in that space, followed by Asia and then uh, North American uh, region. Of course, Africa, you know, is, is, is low at that, at that very, um, in that very, uh, um, indices, if we, if, we, if we look at it. And then what's also striking, uh, particularly interesting in terms of current trend, is that non-migrants, you know, that in, in, in continents like, like Africa and, you know, a few places in, uh, 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 in, um, in Asia and, and, and uh, South America, uh, you see that, you know, you still have significantly people not moving. You know, you have, you have more people who qualify as non-migrants, you know, in uh, Africa particularly, you see the case for uh, a, a big country in West Africa, you see the same thing, you know, uh, when you go to uh, North Africa as well, and then Eastern Africa, you know, you see uh, a, a situation where 99% of the population in those places, you know, still remain in place, uh, not, not, not moving. Of course, a lot of um, issues have shaped um, uh, the constitution of, of, of dream migration and then the production of migrants, you know, in, in a lot of places in recent years, issue of displacement as a result of conflicts, you know, in, in countries like Syria, Yemen, uh, Congo, um, uh, we've seen also in, in, in South uh, Sudan and also in Sudan, particularly recently, uh, in the, in the uh, last few days, you know, uh, a lot of um, crisis, which is also driving um, uh, people out of uh, their, their homes. 
And then we also see economic and political instability, you know, places like Venezuela and then um, in, in, in Afghanistan. And particularly also climate induced uh, um, uh, movements, you know, being a, a particularly uh, important um, trend. But of course, yeah, not all countries are experiencing these um, in, 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 in the same way. So we can talk about how um, we can talk about how um, um, certain patterns, you know, still remain um, uh, recurring. So we see technology and geopolitical um, context and environmental transformation shaping um, the, the the process of movement. And technologically, you know, we can talk about how people's um, people who are moving are relying increasingly, you know, on on um, on a technology to get information real time. Particularly those uh, you know who are moving irregularly, you know, along um, along um, certain uh, migration corridors, or how uh, migrants you know who are settled in, in foreign uh, countries are also using apps to connect and stay um, uh, stay connected to people left behind, or also being used to um, sort of um, uh, improve their own integration within uh, the place that they that they have settled. And the kind of identities also that people are also um, are creating, you know, using um, technologies. Geopolitically, it's about um, the struggle, you know, uh, for 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 a multiple multipolar world, you know, where a lot of uh, you have more you have power, you know, being sort of like decent decentered, you know, from 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 the from the uh, from Euro from from the global north, uh, where uh, there are all kinds of actors, you know, emerging in that space, and this, of course, preventing. Um, uh, collaboration, you know, in terms of global um, governance of migration, you know, where you have um, countries finding it increasingly difficult, you know, to cooperate, you know, in, in, in terms of um, supporting uh, huge frameworks, you know, for migration governance, such as the SDGs and the rest of them, or even the Global Compact for Migration. And then you see how this struggle, you know, um, uh, among states also making it difficult for um, countries to collaborate in support of organizations like the IOM, the WHO, and um, other organizations within the UN system. And of course, the environmental issue, you know, I, I mentioned that, you know, where um, there's been an argument around um, environmental transformations, you know, uh, marking um, a breaking point, you know, for, for, for the world more, more, more broadly. And of course, the COVID-19 situation, I mentioned this briefly, you know, where there's been a lot of restrictions, you know, um, slowing down, you know, the trend of, of, of movement. But of course, as the, as the, um, um, the world, uh, as a lot of countries are lifting bans and, and, and other things, you know, we expect that, you know, that there will be a lot of uh, movement, you know, movements going back to, say, pre-COVID-19 period. Of course, we are not sure how that's going to evolve uh, in the context of new rules, you know, that are being put in place uh, uh, in different uh, countries. Within Africa itself, you know, we see that um, the, 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 the figure of the audit data suggests that essentially, you know, we have more Africans, you know, um, migrating within the continent, you know, than Africans, you know, going outside of, um, of, of, of the continent. So if you think about, about, about migration, of Africans generally, you know, you you need to uh, be mindful of the fact that a lot of people are actually moving within um, the continent, and that that's what um, the data is showing. Uh, but when um, you also look at um, Africans going outside of the continent, we've seen a lot of movements happening, you know, um, uh, uh, um, happening or doubling, you know, since 19, uh, 1990 to, to, to between 1990 and, and, and 2020. But most of these uh, moves you know happening towards uh europe and asia and, and north america you know to to an extent but what's also interesting that we don't have a lot of people you know uh, a lot of um uh, migrants you know um uh, non-african migrants in african countries so very small number of foreign born are, are residing in in africa and most of these you know uh um, group actually are from asia and, and europe so that of course, can be linked to um, colonial history, but also the the wave of connections, you know, between Africa and and um, and Asian country like 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 China, you know, which has led to a lot of um, uh, inward uh, migration, particularly to sectors like um, like agriculture, to to construction, and a lot of 
um, other, 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 other things. Um, to move further, we also um, could observe, uh, you know, from the data from the World Migration Report also, that uh, North Africa has, uh, North African countries, you know, um, still continue to have the um, largest number of, uh, of, of immigrants, you know, with Egypt uh, being the largest, you know, followed by a lot of um, other countries in, in, that particular, in that particular region. But um, South Africa remains the most significant um, uh, destination you know, uh, a country in Africa. So a lot of Africans are actually going to, to South Africa, like in terms of uh, destination wise now, you know, uh, South Africa ranks really, really high at that, um, at that level. And uh, you can see a big country like Nigeria, you know, still having uh, very few uh, 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 people, uh, even though uh, has the largest uh, uh, majority uh, of, of um, African population. But what a particular trend that is also really obvious, you know, in the context of Africa, is the role of conflict in displacement and, and migration of, of people. You know, you can see here that the first um, the, the, the map at the top shows um, spaces of conflict, you know, are dotting all over all over the African continent. You know, like um, say Europe to 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 South America to um, the Asian region. You know, you see a lot of conflicts. You know, um, happening on, on on the African continent, leading to displacement uh, of people, uh, as compared to people who are displaced. You know, because of um, um, environmental crisis, which you can see from the um, um, lower uh, map. Um, that is um, for global um, uh, global events of of um, extreme climate uh, situations, and moving. Out from that, um, I don't want to uh, waste a lot of time uh, on on these uh, on the on these stats, but to show that there's been a lot of movement, you know, happening, you know, all over Africa, and um, uh, a lot of displacement happening, and of course, Africa also still remains the largest um, space or uh, where um, refugees and displaced people are, are are hosted, and all this change, as I mentioned, you know, that are important. You know, is the COVID situation that has been making it difficult for people to move uh, freely uh, in, in Africa. Of course, um, a, a lot of measures have been have been withdrawn or or, or, or reshaped. So, meaning that people uh, maybe in the last couple of years, there's possibility that um, uh, movements could improve. And in even the context of um, uh, after you know African trade uh, free trade um, agreements, you know, there's likely to be uh, trade related uh, mobilities. Um, all over, but there's also the context of conflict and violence, the climate change. There's a displacement, and of course, women along these corridors are at risk. Labor migration is also a key uh, uh, issue of transformation. I mentioned the issue of hosting and origin of, of refugees, you know, on the continent, and also um, huge remittance uh, being a key part of this process. So a lot of conversations. You know, within um, the African continent, you know, brings idea of remittance, you know, into fold, and how you know IT has played a lot of role in this uh, particular um, space. And Africa, of course, still remains a major transit um, hub. Now, to go into the next section, which you know, despite Africa, you know, not having um, a very high uh, migrant population, if you look at it from the global perspective, you know, one wonders why is the case that there's still this um, um, conversation around Africa almost seeming as though it is representative, you know, of global uh, mobilities. Uh, as you can see here, you know, top 20 destination, you know, on, on the left here, you see that it's US and, and the rest, you know, Africa is not here at all. But if you look at uh, origin of international migrants. You will see that Egypt only comes twentieth in the in, in the top in the top um, in the top twenty uh, countries where migrants you know are coming from. So this raises a question like why is Africa talked about so much? We look at um, one uh, of these uh, response to this in issue of distortion, you know distort distorted uh, uh, narration. You know one of which is that you know most African migrants are crossing oceans to reach Europe. Um, the distortion related to African predominantly uh, that African are predominantly traveling as undocumented and, and moving irregularly. And distortions associated with them, there being many Africans living in the continent for, for, for greener pasture. So these kind of narratives, you know, as uh, sort of like created 
this image, you know, of African migrant as so-called um, um, uh, um, uh, archetypal, you know, um, uh, migrants, you know, from um, a global uh, conversation, you know, around migration more, more, more broadly. But we also locate this um, a issue or more, if you like, fetishization of, of African um, migrant image, you know, two essentialities of uh, migration prevention. You know, the idea that Europe, you know, is being, is being evaded and there's need, you know, the need to sort of create images of discouragement. And these images, you know, are linked to so-called, um, what, what I've tried to call a, a, a pornographization of danger, you know, where African battered bodies, you know, are exhibited and shown on the media, uh, and the issue related to, to enslavement of people along uh, the Sahel or people who are being stopped and placed in, you know, um, um, in, in detention camps. And through this media, um, um, there's been production of what I would call the cor corridors of, of fear. You know, the idea, the concept of both people, both people trying to invade Europe um, through canals and all of that, or the idea of um, invaders, you know, in that has uh, taken hold in places like the United States, particularly under um, Donald, Donald Trump, and then also the spectacles and, and biopolitics of, of, um, of, of um, migrant arrivals, you know, where they are stopped and then people go through all kinds of rituals, you know, at the border, particularly in Europe. But of course, the, the militarization, you know, also emerges. So the um, externalized uh, borders and detention, you know, which of course comes from, from uh, uh, you know, uh, partnership that um, Europe has um, established with uh, countries in North Africa. But also, of course, Rwanda is joining this uh, bandwagon in terms of helping to um, keep Africans in their place. And then to, 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 to sort of um, wrap up, I, if um, questions arise from, um, you know, from the audience around my thinking uh, in the context of uh, the, 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 the JAPA conversation, I, I'm happy to, to elaborate on that. But what has become really interesting, you know, in recent years is how African scholars who are working in the context of um, uh, migration on the continent is to try to um, come up with counter narratives you know, that sort of challenge these old um, uh, distortions, you know, that has been propelled by, by the media to make uh, three important points. And one of which is that most Africans are not crossing oceans, but rather crossing land borders within the African continent. And that um, um, a great percentage of African uh, migration uh, across ocean takes on a regular form. And uh, finally, most global um, uh, migrants are not um, African, you know, as we have shown from the data that, that has been presented. And to, to summarize, really, we see that in the context of the nature of migration on the African continent today, we see that um, there's, there's uh, diversity, but also something that um, connects more broadly to uh, a very human uh, process, you know, of, of mobility from countries to country, and that there are important transformations that are occurring that um, require uh, further um, uh, understanding. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and then the, uh, over to you, the coordinator. Thank you so much, Dr. Kudus, for that uh, wonderful presentation. I think uh, people are waiting to ask you some questions, but let's quickly take the last presenter so that you can go to comments, questions, and answers. And that is our own professor, Yabode Mwabwezi. Over to you, Ma. So let me let me just um, appreciate you for the opportunity to have. I don't know, Mausan was there, but he had disappeared now. So we are talking about communication convergence. Um, now you're talking about uh, in and out of Africa. And like I told you privately, I said, yes, I've been thinking of this topic for quite a while. But this opportunity you gave me by inviting me. So thank you very much. So my topic remains uh, uh, complete convergence, cross-cutting the linguistic and technological spaces. So my name is Yabo uh, Denwa Brizzi, like I've been introduced. So I go on now. Now, so the question is, is that what is convergence? And um, so when, when you talk about convergence, you actually talk about things coming together. So this is, and this these are how it differentiates itself from uh, the uh, divergence. And I'm going to be talking about communication convergence here. And this can be seen in terms of bringing together elements involved in the communication process. 
So this is uh, my feed is language, and I'm going to be applying it to the issue of migration as well as technology, like you said. Now, we also call it media convergence, which is another name that we call, uh, we call communication convergence. So we are bringing together elements here. And now the, the theory of, it's not as, as if something new, but then actually it's expressed in terms of races. And we're going to look at these races here about communication and this is passing across a message then we're not talking about the content which is the message itself and then we will call computing and there are the three c's that are come to, that come together to form what we now call the three c's of the communication convergence now how do this interact in terms of these elements are based on the need to get across to the world or a particular audience and then the content of the messages could also be linguistic and could also be graphical it could also be and you also a lot of uh, pictorial or graphical, you can actually also be talking of the video. And then it is now leveraging on technology. The technology could be a phone, it could be a PC, or it could be a tablet. And like we are going to see when we talk about the convergence of these things, you will see how they come together. So now how do uh, technology itself come together? Now, so this is a whole area to talk about because you have three different kinds of, uh, different kind of convergence, of course, and technology is also one of them. And that is that you have now one single device can do a lot of things that other devices can do. You have your phone here. Some of you, you can listen to radio on your phone. You can uh, record on your phone. You can take pictures on your phone. You can do, you can play video on your phone. You can do all kinds of, so this is a way that technology has come together. And then this thing can be maybe a phone or it could be a computer, but whatever it is that it is that these things, element devices that are different are brought, are being brought together to do the same thing. Now, what are the meeting points? So, like we have talked about, we are talking about uh, convergence in this kind of uh, these uh, different areas of communication or media of technology. Then the question is, uh, how do all these things? How do they interact? How do they come together? That become the question. So, communicators also converge. That is also the issue here. That the communicators also converge, and then now the convergence will now also be cultural. Then let's let's us um, talk about the. I mean, this relates to what we have been hearing all this while. So some call it imperialism. When you look at the the fact that okay, America is imposing itself on the, the European continents or whatever is imposing itself on people, and some call it colonialism. Then some call it. Um, but we also have asked ourselves, what about the bottom up type of cultural convergence? So the questions I have is that what happens to the interactions and influence created? across border due to technology convergence because the world is no longer isolated like we used to be. Then what happens to the platform that be broken that, that are broken down brothers and create an interaction that were previously unimaginable instead you obtain a visa and then you buy a plane ticket. So these are the questions. So let's look at the Nollywood. There's a Nollywood invasion in the world. I remember when I went to um, UNISA, I, I can't remember now about four or five years ago. And the first ah, they would be asking, oh do you know that man who came over? What is his name? Uh, Sophia, they were, no, I was surprised they were because I don't really watch the videos as much as that. But these people in UNISA, they were telling me so much about the films and what they have known, and that's what, what we call it. It is because the world has become a global village. So, this is a, an example of cultural convergence because now we have been able to move now from across our border into different parts of the world. Then, what about also the convergence of language? When you look at the big kind of people we want to talk about here, we talk about people that speak the same language, but that language may not be English, may not be Yoruba, but it is a language that is virtual. It's a language that they all understand. It's a language that they can all relate to. And this is what we are talking about. So, so when you also talk about convergence of language, we are talking about science and structures. Of course, that is syntactic, where they are the same and they, are, um, they can relate. So I still have 10 minutes. Now then enter the generation Z. I did a whole study on this particular generation um, that I present to the university in India then. And I found a lot of interesting things about these particular people. They are the generation of the social media. They were born there, that's where they live. But then these people are probably our children, many of us that are here today. And these are, but our, our own generation was the generation of reading novels. Like for me, maybe me and beans, Bones have the chase. There may be a graduate to Daniel still. But then, this kind of generation, we were living in a world that was already. But this generation we have now, these are guys that travel with time. 
they cross borders every day. They cross the Atlantic Ocean without moving to anywhere. And they cross the Pacific Island one, but they don't need visa neither do they bother to go get one. So how do they do that? The question is, is it by astral travel? No. They do not address astral travel at all. Why you are sleeping, they are awake. Why? Because data is cheap at midnight. So let's start at the platform that they use to do this, they are crossing across borders. For them, they TikTok. They TikTok, they interrelate, they, they interact. So these people are having fun with the situation that you have around you, that are real situations around you. They use this thing to create content. And of course, many of us know about um, uh, citizen journalism. I think you, um, CNN used to call it a report. I don't know what there's a name that uh, China Selection calls it. These are people that get this in real time and they post it for you to see. There, there are also challenges there. They, this, this is gaming. They have live matches. Yes, you cross continents. I, I think I've been on Twitter once and then somebody, I think the guy was from, I don't know whether Europe, and they wanted to have a cross match with me. And I, so you see, this, if you have been into some of these live matches, there's a lot of tension. And at times the winner takes up, but of course it is still fun because it is game. Then what about fights? You go to Twitter. There you, there you have a public square where people come from everywhere and we talk, you trash, you abuse, you whatever you need to do. Of course, if you don't get banned, and then you start. That gesture could be you and I, because maybe that's why most of us go there to fight. That, then you have what you call the spaces there now. It, it has replaced clubhouse. There used to be clubhouse where people come from everywhere and everybody discuss what is the current issue. Then what about sales? You go to IG, Instagram. There you do a lot of marketing. Of course, you have the real life, you have the fake life. But you also have, have the IG life. You either buy or you do not. And of course, this has misled many young people because they see the fake life and they tend to think it is real. Then you also have the Facebook. You have Facebook Live, you have Facebook Watch, you have free comment, you can comment and you say, where are you from? You can come from anywhere. You can be my neighbor in the next, in the next house, or you're actually from, it doesn't matter, but all of us meet at that place. Then what about YouTube? You also have live streaming. It is going on live, unfair, but all of us meet at this and that, and then we all relate them. So you can make your comment and you can reply. You can get inside. If you have like uh, real live conversations, you can also have them there among the participants. Then what about the contents? These are made from from your from your phone, your PC, your tablet that you have. That is what you use to make your contents. And then these contents could be in linguistic of Victoria, and then they travel far. They travel without uh, distinctions. There are no restrictions to where they can go. Of course, except you are banned or you are in a country where you have your, your, your platform is done like we had in Nigeria at the time with Twitter. Now, who are the participants? These are content creators, also, they are also consumers. And these are young people. I mentioned them, they are Generation Z. But also, I've also mentioned the one that is also our own generation. Maybe your own is Twitter, your own is LinkedIn. It could be any of them. But they could be from anywhere. And that is the point, because there are no more barriers. And then you can be a creator, you can also be a consumer, depending on the one you decide to, the space you decide to occupy. So you, you can bring into space what we need to discuss the ideas, like what, of course, we have seen now that even Zoom has made it easy for us to do this. Then what about technology? What is its role in all this? More and more imagine, and now what making a world a global building, which we, when we're talking about global, globalization, at that time, it was looking like it was one thing that was far and um, unreal. But today, a child can be in America. But you would think that, okay, that child in Nigeria is far behind. But it is no longer true. Because when you talk of TikTok, they are all, they are, they are all at the same page. And that was why I said the language may not be English. The language may not be Yoruba. The language may not be Hausa. But they all speak the same language and they understand one another. So you have the trends, which are usually near and alike. And then you also have the trumps, which are likely to be the same issues that they are discussing and they are pouring over. And then in this case that you see them, they share the spaces on IG, on, on, on the FB, on YouTube, or, or TikTok, whatever. 
these are the spaces that all of them they come to. So now, what does it mean? Barriers have been broken down. Barriers have been broken down. So no longer are borders holding them back. Yes, they are still in where they are in their nations, but they are no longer held back. They do not need to go to the embassy. So now here now you have Uncle Sam asking Nigerians now that you can have five year visa to come. Of course, we are talking about Japan. That's why I put there's a whole discussion on that. We are talking about Japan. Now, I don't know. Only Uncle Sam can answer why he wants to Japan now five years, you can now move. I don't know. But then the, the truth is, is that real time experiences are shared. And that may also be why, because of the global village that we have created. Why America could not say, okay, everybody can come. I don't know how that really that is. But then the barriers are being broken down. Why? So what do we now say this space? Let us maintain a space that is still private. Yes, the world is watching. So we do not talk so that we can don't work, work naked in the public square. I just watched a video of Nigerian stranded in, in, um, in Sudan a few days ago. But then it's already there on LinkedIn. Everybody is seeing it already in Twitter. Everybody is talking about it. And that is also pushing the uh, government in here. And then interesting, another interesting thing is this. You see Nigeria not being allowed to enter into Ethiopia. Why? Why? And this is the same Africa. What can we say? That let, let us be responsible even as we break the barriers. What spaces the technology does not forget. And it may also not forgive because it could be undoing eventually. So this is why, this is what I have to say now. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much for being time conscious. And thank you for the wonderful presentation. It's been a very uh, interesting and uh, educative afternoon. I know that uh, I have seen the hand of Emeritus Professor up since, and I know he will kickstart the comment, question, and answer session. Uh, like I advised before we started this presentation, we just take all the questions and comments, then individuals will now start to rest, you know, crowded or, you know, the whole thing mixed up. So let's just get it. My question is to so, 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 and the person take, takes notes. Start with our emeritus professor, Professor Sogolu, sir, over to you. Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Prof and, and coordinator. The First of all, I want to congratulate the presenters, the three of them. They are all distinct, you know, interesting uh, presentations. But, you know, I want to make a general point. Normally in a symposium, there should be a theme that holds together the discussion. In other words, a symposium should normally be a topic so that you can relate one to the other and so forth. Uh, and I think this is not the case here. It, it appears that uh, you have picked three distinct, you know, uh, uh, topics, and uh, it becomes difficult to know how to uh, connect them. It's always better, but this may be another way of doing a, a symposium. But what I found is that here are excellent presentations, but we cannot immediately see the connection. Uh, maybe no, no connect, you didn't intend any connection. Maybe that's another way of, of looking at it. I, uh, I want to say one thing, if you permit me to say that, which is rather personal. You find that there are three presenters here who have their roots connected with the burden. And that makes me very proud uh, that you look at Emeritus Professor BYG, for instance, he is an authority on his subject. Every pronouncement that comes from his mouth is, you know, key. And anybody in philosophy will pick anything that he says and you're home, you know, that's fantastic. And I'm proud to be associated with such a, uh, a person. Uh, when a father, you know, sees the children doing better than he is doing, then the father should be very proud, and that's what I, I really say. 
here. The other two, incidentally, the young uh, Dr. Uh, Kudu Sadebayo is again from Ibadan. And uh, you know, I'm very proud. You can see figures, research, serious work done. And, and again, that makes me uh, proud. Now, what about my dean? All right. I, I'm glad that he didn't go too technical, but part of it was a bit uh, technical. It's a very interesting thing. And I believe that these three ought to have be given their own spaces separately. And that would be more interesting for, in fact, more rewarding even for uh, uh, the, uh, the center rather than, because what we are doing now, there's a little bit of rush here. We have rushed them and the discussion is not going to be uh, as rewarding as it would have been if we gave them their own spaces to present separately. Uh, I don't want to take much time. I just want to congratulate the presenters and uh, to say to them that I'm proud to be associated with them. Uh, my dean, the UI researcher, and of course, my own, uh, the man I'm proud to say is my product, uh, Emeritus Professor BYG. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Um, <laughs> well, I will wait till time, the time we are going to answer to respond to some of your comments, sir. So let me just leave that for now. Coming. So I would let BC make the next comment. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, uh, Prof. And uh, uh, it's very nice to have been there. Uh, like uh, Professor Merito said, I. I uh, might just comment and also to to revel in the in the glory that uh, they all they all have UI <laughs> they all have UI UI connection just like uh, just like uh, just like me. Now I I was I was only able to listen to the first and the last because I was uh, I was having a another meeting in the third front office which finished so I listened to. The first Professor Bewaji and uh, listened to. I came in just before the second second speaker uh, finished. I returned back and then finally I listened to uh, Professor Mwabuzi's. Uh, but I think the three of them are quite good. I found that of uh, uh, the dean of uh, arts very interesting because, like I had made comment earlier. Uh, for those of us in science like me, uh, I, I find it very interesting now to see that there are linkages in these this topics that seem to be far different. And I was quite happy that she brought in uh, our own perspective about uh, communication convergence. And I can see the sense, uh, the sense in it. I think the, the uh, three of them must have done uh, justice to, to the topic. But like uh, Professor Emeritus Sogulo said, I think we we lost part part of the benefit because uh, the three the three speakers spoke at the same time. Uh, I think one will have been okay, and I and I hope it is not because of the change that the board uh, suggested. That's why you put the three together. Uh, if not, uh, we, we regret that decision. If it was because of what the board said that uh, we should be having it uh, less frequently as as uh, you used to have it, uh, uh, I think next time maybe we can we can revert back to one single presenter so that we will have a full discussion on on it. But I thoroughly enjoyed myself for Professor Bewaji, who almost who spoke as if he, uh, he was speaking from. From his uh, from his back backhand uh, brain, without uh, looking at notes, uh, I, I really praise his scholarship. And of course, uh, the the person, the second person, was much younger, uh, I presume. And so I only listened to maybe the last three minutes of his presentation before Professor Wabuze came in. So thank you very much again for, for giving me the opportunity to air this comment. Uh, Thank prof, you, sir. Yeah, yes, I greet you, sir. Professor Suglo. Thank you, sir, for your comments. 
I, I will respond later, but so I can see here, I I hope I'm calling it well. So that person can come, then followed by Professor Samson Olatuji. Let's have those two together. Okay, over to you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. I found this session very instructive and very important to developing our curriculum and our, uh, our freedom in all aspects. Um, I've always advocated for uh, using our indigenous knowledge, you know, putting this into good use as Professor Bewaji had pointed out and so eloquently analyzed. But I also realized that uh, the power in diversity, we need um, the contemporary knowledge or the universal knowledge, which really is the colonial information, educational system, the European something, to inform and to improve our own indigenous knowledge. Like he pointed out, um, or something like that. So we need to collaborate, we need to look for the best in our indigenous, indigenous form of knowledge and practice, as well as take what benefits us from the European um, system of knowledge. And that is the advantage they've held over us for so, so many years. That is taking, really taking from our own knowledge, but not acknowledging and dressing our knowledge in you know, clothing their knowledge, our, our knowledge in their own appearance and making it look like this. Let me give an example quickly. Take the issue of breastfeeding. You know that in contemporary times, the Europeans now, you know, in the medical sciences are teaching our people how to breastfeed, uh, young mothers, how to breastfeed, which is, I find insulting and totally ridiculous because when they came, when they came in contact with us, we were breastfeeding, but for their own purposes, they introduced bottle feeding, which is unhygienic, which is expensive. They were selling the milk to us, the powdered milk. They were selling the bottled milk to us. And so it drained our own form of indigenous knowledge, indigenous economy, it just deprived, and if we say that resistance to colon, uh, colonization started at the point of colon, uh, colonization, why can't we now, especially at least 60 years after independence, be using and drawing strength from our own indigenous knowledge? Instead, we are having a UC again, which Professor Boaji termed the Senate constituted as itself as Senate of Knowledge. So that's just uh, that part of it. And also, I think part of our problem uh, in many African countries is that we get these degrees, we do not apply the knowledge we have uh, to our daily lives, to improving our economy, to improving our politics. But how can we, when we are exporting foreign knowledge, we do not find the relevance ar around us. And so it is difficult for our graduates to apply this to the endemic problems we have in our various communities and countries. Um, let me move to, um, I have a question for Dr. Adebayo um, on the issue of migration. Um, in, in, I want to ask that in his research, what has he found um, to be the reason or to be the um, reason behind the in, in, um, increase of female migration? Because I remember in the 1980s when we were in, in, um, migration was taken uh, on off in Nigeria, we used to, the jingle used to be, Andrew, don't go. Andrew, don't check out. Andrew, don't check out. And I responded, yes, 
Victoria also checks out, <laughs> you know, so it's not only Andrew who has to check out. So what is now responsible for this increase in, um, um, in the um, female migration? Uh, and I also enjoy the question of uh, um, on the three C's, the cultural convergence, which is my area, find that very fascinating. So thank you very much. Those are my questions and my comments. Thank you very much, Ma. I am sorry, I've just been told that this speaker is an emeritus professor. So thank you, Ma, emeritus professor, or more for Labo at Jayishun I'm sure I have been able to get the name right. Thank you very much. The next person is um, Professor Samson or Latunji Sa, after which Professor Akin Tijani will ask his questions or make his comments. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Um, each of them has been a wonderful presentation, really. It was Professor Bewaji and cross-disciplinary uh, advocacy in our educational system. I want to ask, how would you rate and introduce into the Nigerian uh, system of education in which one every and take courses from faculties other than their faculties of enrollment. Do you think that a multi cross disciplinary spirit in them? Of course, let me just say that I personally have observed uh, a deficiency in that. When you look at the contents of these courses, you realize that they don't take into consideration the fact that these people are not being brought up to be specialists in those fields. So when you see English language content programs, you will think they want to make the engineering people specialists in English. Same goes for law and others. So apart from this deficiency I've observed, please, what do you, how far do you think the general studies program can spirit of a multidisciplinary outlook to education? And as for Dr. Kudus, um, migration and JAPA are not the same. What is your own take on that? Is, is there any Maybe we should allow Professor Tijani to talk. Uh, th thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Mine is um, just to commend all the speakers for adding value and uh, sharing knowledge. I have personally um, learned a lot. The other thing that I want to say is that it seems I'm the only one with a black hand or brown hand. Others are yellow, and, and we are talking about decolonizing, you know, uh, knowledge uh, within the African context. It is high time we also show it uh, through virtual emicons and uh, uh, identify with our appropriate uh, ethnicity or nationality. Uh, also, uh, Professor, I just want to make a comment where I think she she's gone. Professor, I've forgotten her name now. This professor before the last uh, speaker. Is it showing Ka or? Okay, in any case, I, I think I can, uh, you know, uh, fix the, the, the face to who that person is, a great, you know, scholar and uh, one of our great teachers. Uh, we're serving on the, the same board. But lastly, lastly, more importantly, which is about, so is the fact that I'm, I will be teaching a course in fall, that is August, 2023. And I posted, but this posting is uh, only uh, visible to the center. Uh, the, the, the title of the, of the course is Migration, Development and Politics in West Africa. Uh, it is um, one of the uh, global studies uh, issues. So, my request is this, if you have published, because I want to queue, and I've always been doing that with uh, what professor, distinguished professor Okebukola taught us, that please stop citing all these Oyibo people. Stop citing, if you cannot find your fellow countryman or African man that has written, then you can go to the next level. So I really would like those students in that class come August uh, to, to read about us, about you, 
So if you have anything, please share with me through Professor um, uh, Aneto or send to me directly. My email is there. I still have access to all my emails, but don't block me. I'm still doing gratis uh, PhD <laughs> supervision. So when I say I still have access, so it's just for me to receive and uh, communicate with the three PhD students at uh, NOU and that I'm you know, uh, supervising gratis. So please uh, email me, let's share knowledge, help me out. I'm also learning every day. Again, I thank you so much. The main challenge I have with Professor Bewaji's presentation is that how I wish the Yoruba nation is united. How I wish we can have a common language. Okay, how I wish we are not even speaking English in this on this platform, that we are speaking maybe an African. <laughs> so that is the deep and depth of colonialism that has robbed of, of, of our intellectual property. Again, in our individual uh, space, we will try to reshape and I'll be looking forward to your contribution uh, in terms of articles that I can cite that the students can read in, in August, and uh, some of you will be invited to give virtual uh, presentation. Uh, mind you, it's going to be gratis. I, I love gratis. Uh, of course, I'm also an abinga of uh, you uh, being paid for your intellectual properties. But in this case, you know, we are trying to live up to what Professor Aneto is preaching that we should. Uh, 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 continue to give, uh, to share knowledge. And I believe all our senior people here, our teachers uh, are also of the same view. I thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you at 11, your four o'clock today, at the Eternal Wilson Global Leadership Lecture Series, which is going to be interesting, as interesting as this. Uh, the speaker is from UNESCO. Uh, based at the University of Cape Coast. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Professor Tijani, for those comments. And uh, I can see my dreams hand up, and I cannot but ask him to say something before I now make my comments and allow the speakers to respond to the comments and questions generally. So, Professor Adamu, over to you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Director. Time. Thank you for the, uh, uh, the Center for organizing these wonderful talks and for the speakers. Uh, mine is, I just want to throw something uh, on the issue of the new bill that the federal government is trying to sign into law that will prohibit people from traveling out, particularly uh, the medical professionals. So I want to know the view of the speakers as how will this affect uh, migration? Is it going to do it positively or negatively when the federal government now say uh, they have to stay for a certain number of years before they can leave? Uh, that's just my take on this. So I want any of the speakers to help us with any idea or their own view on this particular bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Adamu of Health Sciences of our own university. Thanks for that comment. Let me quickly, before I ask the speakers to comment or to respond rather, I want to say, I want to answer Professor Sogolo's um, concern about this not being a symposium. If I can take you back, sir, to the theme for today. I hope Professor Sogolo is still there. Let me, because I really wanted him to, uh, okay, he's still there. Um, the theme for today's presentation is in and out of Africa. Then there's a colon, it says nature, multidisciplinarity, and convergence. So, sir, those three uh, variables are the concern of this in and out of Africa. And I think every speaker has, uh, has, has attempted to address this. So I wouldn't say there are three distinct topics per se. Yes, the speakers cannot just be talking about all the three at the same time. So each one addressed each of the sub-theme that we have here. Somebody has done that with disciplinarity. Another person has taken nature. 
and uh, tagged it to in and out of Africa is simply about migration. And then the convergence has also addressed it. So I don't think we were not addressing a theme. Then secondly, my VC was worried that could it be because we have a change to monthly presentation, which we said would take effect from May. This very theme was put forward since February and the speakers can attest to that. They all, nobody here had it less than one month, six weeks ago. And we only had our meeting first week of April, deciding that we shall have once a month presentation henceforth. And we agreed that it will start from May. So it is not because of that meeting's outcome that three people are here. And I want to draw our minds by that. If you look at the last two years, we have been having one symposium, one round table in the year, so two. And that has been the style, the practice. We have a symposium followed by a round table. So this is the symposium. First of all, okay, I'm, I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. <laughs> but it's great. We are likely to have a round table by the end of the year where, but then now that we are worried that they have too little time, I was yeah. trying not to play too long here because I know we always complain that the meeting is too long because if we allow this to have 30, 30 minutes, you can imagine it's almost two and they have not responded. So it means by three, we are still here. And people tend to complain, internet connectivity is not friendly. Oh, we are over sitting. So I was trying to cut down. That's why I made it 15 minutes. I know that each of our speaker is capable of speaking for one hour, if we don't mind. And I don't really mind. I can stay here all day. It's my work. Thank you. I, I thank, you thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's all right. Yeah. You, sir, and others who always say the time is too short. Hey, too long. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. OK, thank now. You over to our presenters. So I don't know who wants to set the ball rolling, but maybe we'll go in the direction of how they spoke. So the first person that spoke was Professor, Emeritus Professor Bewaji. So I let him take the floor, followed by Dr. Okudus, and then followed by Professor Yabo Wabizi. Please, oh, let's take it in that order. Our response is to the people's concern. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, um, my yoga and um, mentor for the compliments. I don't know how much of it I deserve, but um, you know, uh, thank you so much. Um, the, there weren't many questions uh, that required uh, too much attention. Um, the, the three speakers, those who spoke after me actually helped me to elucidate a number of the things to which I could not have attended, uh, given the time constraints. And for that, I want to thank them for a wonderful uh, presentation. I have a, um, probably a bad habit. Uh, before I do a presentation, I like to write an essay. Uh, usually it is from that essay that I would extract, if I have the time, the PowerPoint. Uh, most of the issues that were raised were also mentioned in my, in the essay, which I could not have uh, read. So um, as regards the question which um, uh, Professor Samson Olatunji was trying to raise about cross-disciplinarity and the general studies, as we have it um, from the NUC mandate. I didn't quite hear the question uh, properly, but the general courses that I did as an undergraduate at the University of Ife, uh, you know, now known as Obafemi Awolowa University was such that uh, it presented us with the kind of information that helped us to see other dimensions of reality. I remember sitting in, uh, in the Humanities uh, Lecture Theater Auditorium One and listening to Professor Shoyinka, you know, uh, our own Kongi, uh, speaking about various aspects of culture 
And then we had that thing about science. And uh, for the first time, we learned about the, the half-life of radioactive substance, which many of the people who make decisions about the use of atom bomb and all those things probably don't understand that radioactive substance actually don't degrade for thousands of years. They are still very active. So um, I, you know, I know that the intention was not to make uh, engineers to be linguists or to make um, you know, doctors to be philosophers. I believe the intention was to give a rounded education, but given the way in which the semester system is structured, um, you know, moving from pillar to posts, more everybody in the pressure cooker, and little is digested, little is understood, and that needs to be looked at within our educational system. Uh, the, the presentation, you know, I just would comment about uh, the prohibition of, uh, uh, of migration. How effective can that be? Uh, we know that, you know, in Nigeria, laws are made and they are obeyed in, uh, in you know, they are observed in disobedience. Because, yeah, I mean, uh, most of our youth actually nowadays don't see the reason to go on NYC because they have understood that public service doesn't make any sense. It can't, it doesn't pay them the salaries at regular interval. Whatever it pays them is not enough to support life. So what is it that they're, they're legislating about? It's, it's, um, I think, you know, whoever is connected with those making such a frivolous and vexatious law to tell them that it cannot, you can't, you can't, you can't prohibit people from moving from one place to another, uh, seeking greener pastures. What is Nigeria today has been populated by people who migrated from various places over thousands of years. And that is not going to stop. Nobody can legislate the end of it. Uh, the Trump man and his junta in the US was not able to dissuade people from moving around the Americas. So how is... Uh, how is a government that doesn't even have the capacity to enforce any law going to ensure that nobody migrates to, to people who travel across the road and go to Ghana and board and go wherever they want to go, you know? So um, that's just my, my response. And I want to thank um, all the presenters, my colleagues for a wonderful um, effort. Uh, Dr. Adebayo, Professor Kouabuizi, thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. We really also thank you for your wonderful presentation. So over to Dr. Kudus Adebayo. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you uh, very much uh, for, for, for your questions. Uh, and thanks uh, to Prof as well for, for his um, um, eloquence. Now, the, the, the first question I have relates to why, what's behind the increase in, in uh, uh, female migration. And th this conversation has been on for a while, um, uh, but a, a lot of um, ideas converge around the fact that, you know, more and more women are becoming, you know, breadwinners and, and, and all of that. So gender role is changing around livelihoods and, and family and, and things like that. And so there's um, also the process of family unification, you know, women who are going abroad, you know, to join their husbands and, and things like that, or women who are moving specifically because of marriage, you know, to, to, to other places. Now, there's also the context of um, um, education, you know, a lot of women going, you know, because of, because of, of more education or women who have become experts, you know, uh, in certain areas and then are not going abroad to find work. No, so this is particularly interesting in the context of um, uh, nurses and doctors, you know, migrating from Nigeria, particularly to the UK, you know, in the last couple of years, you know, so this is like, um, um, uh, if you look at um, nursing, for instance, it's dominated by women, and a lot of them, and you can see from the crisis being faced by the nursing council, you know, women, you know, living to um, join their labor force uh, uh, internationally. So that these are, these are key processes, you know, that have been used you know, to make sense of uh, women's uh, involvement. Now, the question around uh, whether or not Jack Bar and migration are, are, are the same. I, I would say that um, essentially, I think it's a, a local,
local um, understanding or maybe like understanding of um, of migration as is occurring as is occurring right now in Nigeria. So Jakpa sort of captured the spirits, you know, of uh, a wave of migration that is also connected to to young people's imagination about about life and their sense making around um, uh, a country that uh, a giant that is struggling to stand up and, and and all of that and the way they try to navigate, you know, disillusionment, you know, and and then the despair associated with you know nation building in contemporary in contemporary Nigeria. So when people like um, uh, uh, I think I think Falola, you know, made a very interesting observation around that. You know, we're talking about Japa as the uh, progress of just trying to flee, you know, from abusive relationship or something or institution that is extremely, you know, um, demanding and life threatening. So it's just essentially fleeing from Nigeria, and and that, of course, is talking about uh, migration. So if you want to think about it in the context of displacement, it will mean that this is a voluntary, you know, displacement, you know, as it were, uh, in, the in, the, in the current times, and it speaks essentially to migration. And the last one, you know, provision of doctors and nurses. I think I'll tell the line of, um, of Professor Bewaji, uh absolutely, uh, but we also had that um, it is important, you know, that states, you know, continue to be interested in, in, um, in migration issues, and um, um, but government should sort of like play more role in ensuring that it's able to absorb capacity and extract um, services, you know, extract services uh, committed from those um, trained at government expenses. Of course, this is an interesting conversation to have, but this position doesn't suggest as such uh, people must earn slave wage, for instance. You know, I would also, also say this, believing that um, countries at different states at different times, you know, should determine how uh, individual or collective labor migration uh, rights and all of that, you know, how, how they engage with it. So there's no way that this kind of policy, you know, would not infringe, you know, on rights that are universally protected and all of that. And I don't think there's any meaningful or serious outcome that can come from trying to legislate how people move or whether or not people sell their labor in, 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 in whatever way. Now, the final thought on that essentially is that um, from, from quoting from, from uh, Yesan Shiri, you know, who talked about migration, she said uh, that no one leaves their home unless the home is the mouth of a shack. So when people are leaving, there's probably something chasing them away. And that is what, you know, needs to be addressed, you know, at government and at policy level. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm smiling because I just like the last quotation. The shark is here. That is why we are running. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kudus, for that uh, wonderful comment. And finally, I am now calling on Professor Molara Wambweze to make her comments to the questions and answers. Thank you, Ma. Um, I, I, I just, um, just wish for us to just as um, elders, we need to think for the future of our children, and that should actually be a concern to us. When, when we talk about all that happened in this country in this year, so we are, I'm glad about what the last speaker said last. We need that the desperation of our youth about this country actually because of the, all the problems they are facing. And um, we should be concerned about that. Yes, they go on social media and they think of what uh, happens. At times they are deceived, at times they are, they are, their money is collected, but then it's because they cannot see hope. And, and I always tell people, when you see, it's not that the people are doing how you want to do it, but then you just cannot see hope. And then you see people that are criminals, they are getting away and they're being celebrated in this country. These are the things we are sad we need to talk about. Then let's also look at the question that was asked. I mean, I find it laughable if a government said it's legislating. Now you use years to train your people and then before they said they don't even care if they go. But now they are making laws to say they cannot go. I, I don't really know we can do that because Nigerians, that's why we are unique. We always find a way around whatever the government wants to do. But it's better to advise people that are making the law that are just making laughing stock of themselves. We have been laughed at enough in this country, and I think it's time that we move ahead and do better things. But whatever we do, let's think of these children. Yes, they may, we may think that they don't know, but at the time when you engage them, you'll be surprised at people what they know. And then you also see that knowledge has actually become so accessible to them during these different platforms that they use. They get access to, to knowledge. You, 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 you see that with their phone, they can do so much, so much. And then you now think that this kind of people, you think that it's only when you see them that carry a book and read. No, they may actually know more than you. But what they may lack, 
because that was what was interesting me about what um, what the major uh, professor Emeritus was saying, and the fact that in the concept of Omoluabi, that is where we need to come in. But what example are we showing them for us to show that they should be Omoluabi? And let us search ourselves and let us ask. So I want to um, appreciate my students that are able to show up in this. Um, they said they'll be here, and I can see some of them here. So thank you, guys. Um, and, th and thank you, the coordinator and the professor, for the opportunity. And I want to appreciate all my co presenters for the wonderful talk, uh, way you approach the topic and what I also learned from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. We really appreciate you and thank you for your contribution. And to imagine that all this is for free because we want to share knowledge. And that is the spirit. Thank you so much. I appreciate each and every one of you. And I am saying that uh, when we call on some that, we are, that are here, they should please be ready to answer us. And I may be calling on some of you to help me with some people who want to share knowledge here. And like I said, it's not only on migration, but global studies. And so the list is endless. Whatever you can give us on this platform that we can learn, on, uh, learn something from. Now, from next month, we have agreed the board of this, uh, uh, of this uh, center agree that once a month so that the speaker will have enough time, enough preparation and really go in depth in everything the person wants to present. And we will also learn a lot. So from May, we are going to second Wednesday in May, which is precisely, um, is that on the 10th? Let me get the date so that I will know that uh, I'm telling you the correct date now that we shall be online again. So next week, no, no, we are not going to be online. So we are going to be online in May, and that is uh, going to be on the 10th of May. 10th of May will be online. So by his grace, we'll be here and somebody will present to us. We can allow the speaker to speak for one hour, but with this, we may not be able to, uh, to allow one hour because we have three speakers. And I think it's also interesting to have three people look at an imposium again when we talk more about it. But I think it's also a good one. They spice us, they give us the gist and we all talk about it. And we'll be here for two hours plus. And I think that is also good enough. Somebody has hands up. Who is this? Uh, no, Luakbo. Sorry, is it professor or doctor? Can you unmute yourself, please, and quickly make your comments? So that, uh... Thank you very much. I am Anulu Apo, and um, I'm a research fellow in Germany. And um, our center here, too, we look at um, a multidisciplinary approach to environmental problems. And I really like what you're doing. I just want to ask that, how do we get notifications? I want to get, I couldn't get the, it was um, Professor Bewaji that sent this, that's why I got it. I wish to get monthly notifications concerning about your talk. I'm really interested. Thank you very much. And um, quickly in addition to the concept of JAPA, then the idea of uh, JAPA, most times it means, JA means escape, and PA means never return. <laughs> like, I saw it, you. It, the home is, <laughs> Now, as in, it, there's no place. We, what you just want to do now is to go and never return until things get better. And we just hope that <laughs> things will get better so that those who have Jawa will Jawa again. <laughs> Thank you very much. They will not Jawa. When they have Jawa, they can Jawa. That means they escape to come back. <laughs> Thank you so much for that contribution. Well, it is noted. True. Thank you. I want to believe that uh, we all had a, a nice time this afternoon. It was a nice discussion. And I want to thank all the speakers. Emeritus Professor Bewaji, Dr. Kudus Adebayo, and Professor Molara Nwabweze. You've been wonderful. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. And uh, on this note, if no further comments or questions, I may want to call it a day. Thank you so much.